Joining us now in the studio to talk about your health is Dr. Raphael Meyer, transplant surgeon at the University of Maryland Medical Center and associate professor of surgery at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Doctor, thank you so much for, for joining us. Your field, transplant procedures, the number keeps increasing, but the, the need keeps increasing as well. We can't keep up. Good evening, thank you so much for having me. Yes, that's correct. Um, the, the waiting list for organs is increasing every year. More patients are added to, the, to it. Um, we have a, uh, a chart, a graph uh, that you brought that shows over a period of time on the, on the bottom how potential kidney, uh, people with, with kidney failure do. The top line in green is people who get a living donor transplant uh, below that, uh, deceased, below that, waiting list, and without a transplant with dialysis, the prospect can, can be difficult. Correct. Um, basically, what it shows is that the patient would do not have a chance to uh, get a transplant. The, the chance to, uh, unfortunately, to pass away or die while on dialysis is about 50% after five years. And um, for those who get the chance to get uh, a living donor or a deceased donor kidney transplant, the chances to survive at five years are all the way up, up to 90s plus. And that brings us to the, the, the frontier of this field, which is xenotransplantation, and that is animal to human. Correct. Um, to, uh, to try to fill the gap for all the patients who are, uh, don't get a chance to get listed for kidney transplant, uh, because they have contraindication, but also because we have a tremendous organ shortage, we don't have enough organs for everybody, uh, we're trying to fill the gap by uh, coming up with solutions, and one of them is uh, pig to human xenotransplant. Um, there, there have been some early efforts and um, some optimism from that. Correct. So at University of Maryland, we did actually the first case in the world in a living patient. That was a heart uh, transplant to someone who had no other option and would have died immediately without the transplant. Um, and um, you know, we had we learned so much. Um, the the patient survived for two additional months, which was you know, uh, amazing at that time. And uh, we were then followed by other uh, US institutions in Boston and in New York who proceeded with other uh, transplant and um, involving kidney xenotransplant as well. And uh, four have been done so far. Let me uh, remind our viewers, if you have a question about organ transplantation, uh, please send us the question by email, livequestions at mpt.org. The, the challenge, the the biggest challenge is rejection. But what does that mean? So um, the body is designed to uh, destroy what, whatever is foreign. And um, you have this phenomenon between human to human transplant at a lesser extent, but still something that we had to work for uh, decades and decades to overcome. Um, and um, in xenotransplant, it's basically the most difficult situation because the, the organ from the pigs, uh, despite all the genetic modification that we do those day, uh, these days to uh, increase the acceptance of the organ, there are still many uh, what we call antigens. There are small particles in the kidney that are recognized by us, by humans, and we start producing antibodies against them and then the rejection process takes on. So we have to give immunosuppressors to kind of block that. And also, as I mentioned, we do genetic modifications to uh, allow the kidney to be less what we call immunogenic. Is there a range of, of how much um, you can suppress somebody's Im immune system, uh, you know, depending what, what has been transplanted, how, how much uh, immune suppression is, is needed to prevent a, a full rejection? Well, that's, a <clears throat> that's an excellent question. Um, we have to be careful because it's all a balance. If you immunosuppress, if you give too much anti-rejection to someone, they're at greater risk of infection. And the more you push, the greater is the risk. And then on the other side, if you don't give enough, you're at more risk of rejection. Um, so if you push it too far, you can have what we call opportunistic infections that can endanger the life of the recipient, and that's a critical point. 
Um, we can go pretty far, but there is a limit. Is there something about the, these particular organs, kidneys in particular, because we, we know certain animal tissues, think in heart valves, have, have been used in, in people for a long time? That's another great question. Uh, heart valves are what we call decellularized. So basically we wash them of their cells and the antigens that I mentioned earlier, the molecules that are, uh, uh, prob uh, that are giving the reason for rejection are washed away. So basically only the scaffold remains and those um, uh, last much, much longer. But we've recently observed that uh, heart valve might also cause some, to some degree, some sort of very, very, very slow ongoing rejections. How optimistic are, are you when, when you study this, when you work on it in your lab, when you and your colleagues um, deal with hearts and, and other things, other, other medical institutions, if we look down the horizon 10 years, is this gonna be common? Well, that's, a, that's, that's a, a great point. It's, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, there was a saying in the field that we say uh, the future of uh, xenotransplantation is going to remain the future. Uh, and um, it was proven wrong. And we, again, we started, uh, we started it at the University of Maryland, and I think we were, that was, that was uh, when I first saw that heart started to beat. Um, I, I had the impression I was witnessing history. And we heard it for so many years that it would never come, that when it came, it was really almost like science fiction. Uh, now we face new challenges, and we, we learn so much, and it's a stepwise process. So right now we're, again, in a very, very much learning process. I would say in 10 years, I would expect some trials. We would be going on very well-rounded uh, trials with patients who have no other options. Uh, but I would not expect that it would be the, the mainstream yet and the main indication for a transplant. Uh, viewer question, this is Bill, wants to know, do the animal organs undergo any treatment or modification before being transplanted into the human recipient? Now, I mean, I've read about genetic modifications. Beyond that, um, you, you mentioned how the uh, uh, heart valves can be, can be treated. Is there any ability to do that? Well, the living organ is, it has to be physiologically active. So no, we cannot wash them off their, their cells. Um, so the, the, there are several types of modifications. And yes, we, we can modify the, the organs so they are more compatible. The number one, it modifies the sugars. The sugars on top of every pig organ are not completely, they're recognized by the human body. And those sugars, what we call the knocked out. So there are three main uh, enzymes for those sugars that are knocked out. That's what we hear sometimes, triple knockout pig. And on top of that, there are uh, uh, genes added. And sometimes you will see the term um, transgene, meaning that we add some genes, for example, for coagulation, or for a complement, which is also another molecule that is involved in the, in the, in the rejection and, and coagulation, and they're added to uh, enhance the, the, the recognition as not foreign by the human body. And the last one uh, concerns some genetic modification to remove any pig viruses. Uh, for example, there is a virus that the pig have that we don't have. We're, we don't know and we don't think it has consequences in human, but to be completely safe, we remove them uh, from the genome so they're absent. So those are the three kinds of kind of modification we're using right now. Are there potential ethical uh, issues as well? I mean, it seems cut and dried. If someone is down to their last hours, they have no other path to survival other than the heart of a, of a pig. The life of the pig takes the, the back seat there, but people worry about animal welfare. Um, how carefully is that being factored into this research? That is also a very important point, um, <clears throat> and that's a point we, as a community of uh, the xenotransplant research, we give the highest importance. Um, this being said, there, there are 50,000 uh, pigs per, uh, per day almost that are used for, for food and millions uh, every year. So 
um, in any case, I think the use of pigs for uh, uh, medical reasons would be a very low, low, low fraction of that. And but despite this, we we care for for this, and we're trying to make everything possible so those pigs are uh, treated uh, uh, with the the greatest standards. Let's bring it back to the, the bread and butter transplant work that you do. April is Donate Life Month. What do you want our viewers to to know? about this? Well, I think the number one thing is to recognize the, the, the gift from donors. And I think we, it, it's very important to pose and to recognize that. It's uh, uh, every time I see someone, and today I had a couple of people showing up at the, at the clinic willing to donate their kidneys to their next of kin. And I tell them, this is amazing. What you're about to do is one of the greatest things you can do in life. So I think this month is about that, to pose and to recognize that some healthy uh, persons are going on the surgery table to you know, take a risk and uh, to help someone else. And <clears throat> uh, by extension, all the persons who you know, uh, uh, sign up for being an organ donor where uh, something happened to them, that has to be recognized too. But this is, uh, this is an incredible gift and the life they save uh, after the death is are invaluable, and that's that's the time to recognize that. And it, it's not just um, kidneys that can come from living donors because we have two. We need we need one, but you can take a piece of someone's liver, correct? And 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 it grows back, correct? So the liver is is amazing because yes, you can uh, you can split it, and you can donate that part. <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, it will grow back in both the, the recipient and the donor. And uh, in a few weeks, uh, the, the volume of the liver will grow back to normal. So uh, that is also uh, an amazing gift. And one of the things we, we saw in that chart at the beginning of the program was the, the benefit of the, the living donation versus the deceased donor. Correct. It, it makes a difference in those kidney patients. Yes, it absolutely does. The, the living donation donors uh, are, uh, the kidneys coming from living donors are by far the best option. It gives you a, a, the longest graft survival, it's the highest quality of organ, and you can, you know, it can be scheduled and it can uh, really extend the life of uh, their recipient extensively, and that's the best uh, and, option. And, um, for, for people who have not um, mark their driver's license with uh, the donor designation, hesitate for whatever reason, in just a sentence or two, what would you say? I would say it's a personal decision and uh, I, I think this is, this is good that, you know, when you, when you sign up for the driving license, you pose and you think about that. I think the first step is to, to think about it and in many occasions you don't even have to think about that, but to make that proactively is good. It's a personal decision, but um, you know, no, go, there's a saying that say, donate your organ, God knows you, you won't use it up Dr. there. Dr. Meyer, we have to leave it there. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.